Good morning. Uh, it's such a joy to be here with you today. Um, we, I've grown to love Ray. We've prayed for you guys. Uh, it's phenomenal to be in this building. I remember years ago uh, sitting with Ray. We were at a lunch or a coffee shop somewhere, and he's telling us about this crazy proposal. And, uh, and I remember leaving. I told Carl, I was like, that ain't real. <laughs> Nobody's giving them a building and going to help remodel another building, and yet God did it. And so we're, I'm excited to praise God with you and what he's done uh, for your church over the last few years and what he's going to continue to do in the neighborhood. Uh, the title I kind of give my message this morning, as I talk about Pioneer Bible Translators and a little bit of my story, and as we dive into John 1, is the word in the neighborhood. Uh, I love John. I love the Gospel of John, and I particularly love this first chapter. Um, when I get excited, when I go back home and uh, do some work in, a, in the inner city in Shreveport, Louisiana, if anybody knows where Shreveport, does anybody know where Louisiana is? Uh, <laughs> Shreveport, Louisiana, uh, you know, I, I try to contextualize my sermon a little bit. So uh, the word in the neighborhood for you guys this morning, you know, I have a, I come from a Baptist background, but I can get a little Bapticostal sometimes. So I'll try not to be too excited, uh, but sometimes I can't help it. If I just got off the train and I was listening to a sermon by Reverend Charlie Dates, I just get really excited and it kind of spills out. So uh, I'll, I'll try to not go too fast and I won't speak any Greek. How to help our translators. Uh, but as Ray said, uh, I grew up, I still am a CODA, child of deaf adults. Uh, both of my parents are, are deaf. Uh, American Sign Language was my first language. Um, I didn't start speaking a lot of English in my home. Uh, my, my dad was slightly oral, meaning he, he would talk some uh, vocally. Uh, but most of the time I sounded however I heard my father try to speak. And so oftentimes I had what I called my deaf accent uh, that would come out. And uh, being in the South and Louisiana started being put over at my grandparents' house quite a bit so I could start learning how to speak. You may not be able to tell now, but at the time, I'm not sure how helpful that was. I grew up in Louisiana, as I mentioned. So I had a really strong accent, uh, but I've worked really hard uh, to get out of that. That way you would all be able to understand me. And so if I say y'all, uh, that, that means... Uh, you guys, all, all use guys. Is that what you say? Use guys. Yeah. Uh, so if I say things like that, just just be a little patient with me. Um, grew up in Louisiana. Was involved in the Deaf Church there. Uh, usually, what that meant was for a while we were Baptist, and then when they no longer had an interpreter, we were Methodist, and then we were Assemblies of God for a while, and then we were Independent Baptist, and then we were Southern Baptist, and then we were back to Independent Baptist, and because that was the only choice my parents had. If the church didn't have an interpreter. Well, there was, they weren't going to be fed. There was going to be no ministry. They weren't going to hear from the Word of God. And so we had to go wherever there was a, a translator. Uh, eventually found myself in Ethiopia, northern Ethiopia in a region called Tigray. Uh, if you follow any of the world news, you'll know that they've been in a war uh, for the last few years. But that's where we had based our ministry, started a deaf church there, um, worked with several deaf leaders and actually spent a lot of our times in villages around the capital city. Ethiopia, like a lot of developing countries, when someone is deaf, uh, they're viewed to either be demon-possessed or uh, they're the curse. It's a, their deafness is a curse because of some kind of sin, a sin that they've committed or that their family's committed. And that's not a new thing. Uh, any of you guys that are familiar with the passage in your Bible, and Jesus is confronted with the blind man, someone in the crowd says, well, whose sin caused this, his or his parents? And Jesus says, no, 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 that's, that's, that's not how this works. Uh, so we got that question a lot. And so a lot of times, if you had a deaf child, and you were in a culture that is very socially dependent, meaning if, if, if you wanted to survive, your neighbors had to like you. Because otherwise you couldn't trade in the marketplace. Otherwise you'd have no security for your home because people would just look the other way. But a socially dependent society and suddenly you have the markings of someone being demon possessed or the curse of sin, that's very problematic. So a lot of deaf children were hidden uh, from society or um, even thrown out of the homes. And so we would go into villages and we would just say, I'm, I'm just here to find deaf people. And usually the social workers would say, oh, no, we're good people. There, there are no deaf people here. 
And I'll say, that's, that's cool. Uh, we'll see. And over the course of two days, uh, we would just go door to door, and I'm looking for deaf people. Finally, uh, we were sitting down one morning outside our hotel. I, hotel is a word that is used pretty broadly here. It's pretty much kind of cinder block room with a, with a little mat on the floor. But uh, we were sitting outside, and it's customary in Ethiopia to get your shoes shined. I don't know why, because it was all dirt roads. Uh, but we'd get our shoes shined and cleaned before we'd start our day. And Gatacho, the social worker, he's, you know, he's telling me, there's no deaf people here, no deaf people here, no deaf people here. And suddenly, we're waving over this shoe shine boy, and he comes running over, and he's, he's cleaning Gatacho's shoes, and I'm just kind of hanging out. And, and Gatacho looks at him and says, Kame, de you know, which is Tigrinya, is a good morning, how are you? And Gatacho is an older gentleman. It is very inappropriate to not respond to anybody, but especially to Gatacho. This young boy should respond, and yet he doesn't say anything. And the, the older gentleman, Gatacho, says, Ata! Like, kid, you know, you. He's like, can't you hear what I'm asking you? And the kid doesn't say anything else. And I thought, no, Lord, this, is, this will be too easy. And I leaned my hand down where he could see my hand moving, and he, he looked up at me, and I just signed to him, Kame, you know, which is, this is the, what's up, you know, in Ethiopian sign language, and his eyes got real big, and he starts signing back to me, and, and I start having a conversation with him. One, he's freaked out because nobody in his village signs to him that's, that's hearing, usually, but two, it's this white guy that's never been in this village is suddenly signing to him in a language he understands, and Gatacho is freaking out. And suddenly the kid leaves, and, and I look over, and, and I say, none? None? And he goes, well, okay, one, maybe one. But we found 50 deaf people over the course of the day, because the shoeshine boy told me, well, if you want to find more, go down to this house and go ask for their cook, and she's deaf. And then talk to the cook, and then she'll tell you where the, the other deaf people are, because they're a very social community, even here. You know, a lot of people talk about, oh, I just don't think there, there are any deaf people here in our area. I'm like, well, you, you just don't know where they are, or they're just not telling you. you know, you've got to get in. You've got to meet them. You've got to build trust and relationship and then find the community because they're right here in your backyard. There's not just these three or four. There are thousands of deaf people here in the Metroplex or in New York City metro area, and God wants to do something in their lives. And so that was in Ethiopia for a number of years. I'm trying not to make this too long of an introduction, but kind of want to set the stage for why I'm excited about what we do. Uh, came back to the U.S. in 2012, uh, helped design a mobile app that later we uh, changed the name to what's called the Deaf Bible app. Uh, it's a mobile app for smartphones, iPads, online, deafbible.com, where you can access sign language Bible scripture and American sign language and their scripture in about... I think 30, 31 other sign languages, uh, not full Bibles, uh, but portions of Bibles. Today, with nearly 400 sign languages in the world, uh, only one sign language has a full Bible. That's the American Sign Language. And it just completed like two, three years ago. Just two or three years ago. One of the other most influential sign languages in the world is British Sign Language. has massive influence in other sign languages, particularly in the Middle East and in parts of Africa and into Asia. And it today has like, I think now, nine chapters of the book of Mark. That's it. That's it. You think of church history from the Reformation, a very central place for the church, and yet a people group in that area don't have access to the same scripture that you and I do. Do you ever think about that? Do you ever think about that when, when Ray says, hey, we're going to turn to this passage, and you either turn or tap and scroll, about what a blessing that is that we can do that? That the God of the universe, that his spoken, holy, and errant word, that he would make available to us? That's, that's amazing. That's amazing. From there, we founded an organization called the Deaf Bible Society uh, to just help promote the need for sign language scripture and get scripture uh, access to deaf people around the world. And then in 2019, I transitioned out of my role there, and uh, the Lord brought me to Pioneer Bible Translators, who are working in both uh, spoken languages and sign languages, focused on not just Bible translation, but church planting, because uh, we recognize that the power of the gospel includes this, but if I just leave this on the table, it doesn't preach itself. 
The power of the gospel, as Paul tells us in Romans, is that one must be sent and it must be preached. This word has to be preached. The gospel has to be lived out. Jesus talks about, you will be my witnesses. Not just the message you're saying, but the example of your life will speak to the gospel. It's the power of his word and the incarnational living in a community. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. I'll circle back to Pioneer Bible Translators here at the end. i got to hurry. Races, you guys get out at 2 o'clock, so uh, uh, I want to I be fair to that time. Uh, I'm going to read from John 1 uh, here in a minute. Go verses 1 through 18. And there's going to be a bit of scripture reading, and I'm going to hop to a couple places. But I want us to see kind of three things here this morning. I want us to see that the word is authority. The word is authority, and it's authority for us in the neighborhood. The word available and the responsibility of believers to advance the word to all people. So let me pray, and then we'll, we'll jump right in. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you have not left us to be wandering in a wilderness as it relates to your plan for our lives. But you have spoken and you have given us the message and you have shown us what you are doing in the world. Even in Psalm 16, Lord, it says that, that you provide counsel even at night. And so we don't have to be anxious for anything regardless of what the talking heads say on the television or what the newspaper print is, Lord, you have shown us the end of the story. And not only does Christ win, he has already won. And so, Father, we thank you for the hope that we can have in that. So, Lord, we just ask that you would speak today, that you would come forth from your word, and, Lord, today that we would see Jesus. In Christ's name, amen. Let's read. Um, if you have your Bible, open it or uh, tap it. And uh, we're going to read uh, John 1, verses 1 through 18. And so you're not confused. Uh, if you're not familiar with the book of John, we're going to have two Johns that we're talking about here in this first chapter. You've got John the Apostle that wrote this gospel. And then we have John the Baptist that John the Apostle is going to talk about. And so there's going to be two Johns that we're referring to, so I don't want you to be confused. I'll help us kind of clarify that as we go through it. John says here, starting in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now he's talking about John the Baptist. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as, the, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John, the Baptist, bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. There's something significant going on here in this passage. 
John is introducing a people to a message, and he's beginning by setting the stage. The person that I'm going to be talking about in the rest of this gospel, this isn't just anybody. This isn't just one of the neighbors on the block. This person is radically important. And this person is radically important because this person has been before all time. And in this person, everything is made. I love how he starts this passage because it takes people back to the beginning, especially the Jews who would have been familiar with their Bibles and familiar with Genesis 1. that starts with an in the beginning. And what do we know about the beginning and how all things were created? We see in Genesis that God speaks And there is light. And he speaks and things happen. And he speaks and the waters separate into the advance. And he speaks. He speaks. And when we speak, or when we sign something, what what comes out? Words. And so when the God of the universe, John is telling them, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. God in the beginning spoke. And what came forth? The Word comes forth. And by that Word... He tells us all things were made. And not just were they made and it was done, but they were made and now all of those things are sustained. John is very intentional here. This is how we we get a glimpse into the fact that there was a Holy Ghost, a Holy Spirit leading the writing of these things. Because he also changes his words here to clarify, hey guys, I'm not just talking about a thing this kind of ethereal word, because he says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. But he changes in verse three to say, all things were made by him. It's a pronoun shift here. Language is very important. Pronouns are very important. What are we talking about here? And John says, it isn't just a the word, it is a he word. This word is a person. And he tells us that all things were made through this person. And this person sustains all things. And in this person is life. What a powerful message for us when we look at so much death around us in the world. Physical death. Spiritual death. That John is reminding us, no, no, no. In this word is life. And the life was the light of men. And this light shines in the darkness. What's the answer to the darkness around us? Light. Who is that light? It is the Christ. He tells us it's not a what, but it's a who. And I can imagine for the readers of this, it probably gets pretty frustrating. They're going through this, and the the Apostle John is introducing people to this, this amazing person. And yet he hasn't told us who the person is. And then he goes back to say, you remember John the Baptist and what he was preaching in the wilderness? And John says, there's one that comes after me. I'm not, the, I'm not the big dog here. I'm just the guy making room for the alpha that's coming in. Have you ever played the game Clue? Anybody remember that game? It's not, it's not a, it's a, you gotta like move pieces on a board and put stuff in an envelope. It's like a tactical game, board game, you know. Anybody played Clue? Uh, you, you remember the goal was like, uh, uh, who is it? You know, I find that even as we get into verse 19 to 28, you know, John the Baptist says, and this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites for Jerusalem to ask him, basically, he's explaining here, you can read this later, verses 19 to 28, there's an inquisition, and they've sent leaders from the church to say, who are you, man? You Elijah? You Isaiah? The prophets returned? And John's like, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm here to make way. I'm here to proclaim there's one who comes after me. They said, well, are you the Messiah? And he, he adamantly confesses, no, I'm not the Messiah. There's someone else that's here that's the Messiah. And I feel like everyone's going, who is it, man? You know, it's like that game, the clue. It's like, it's Mr. Plum in the library with a wrench. You know, who, who is the person that we're looking for in this game? Give us more clues. And then in verse 29, the next day, it tells us, after this inquisition, it says that John sees Jesus coming to him. And he speaks and he says, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. Finally, John the Baptist points out this mystery 
word, this mystery light, this mystery king of all time. And it's not Mr. Plum in the library with a wrench. He, he points out, and what we inevitably discover later, that it's Jesus in Jerusalem with a heel, a heel on the serpent's head, that he conquers death once and for all. You have to understand how big a deal this is for us. If you claim to be a believer, believer, I have to be careful, you know, not a believer, a believer, if you claim to believe in Jesus Christ and we claim that that he is our Lord and Savior and we followed after him in baptism, we're saying we're one of his. This is a big deal for us. Where do we go to find Jesus? We claim to be followers of Jesus. We claim to be people who've laid down our lives for Jesus. We've died to self. We claim that he's God of the universe in flesh, died on the cross, rose again. It's a big deal. Well, if we claim all these things, what does he tell us to do with our lives? How does he tell us to make decisions? And it's not just a kind of the old quippy, what would Jesus do? But it's what has Jesus said to do? Where do we find Jesus? In Hebrews chapter 1, the the writer uh, helps us understand this a little bit when he tells us that verses 1 to 3, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in the past to the fathers by the prophets. But he has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed the heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So it's a theme here. They're reminding us of who this Jesus is. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So they tell us that in the past, God spoke to the people through the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us directly through the Son directly through the one through whom all things were created and all things were sustained, the one whose death made a way for forgiveness of sins, the one who provides that restoration of relationship between man and God, he's spoken to us through his son. Where do we find Jesus? Well, we find Jesus in the Bible, in his word. We find Jesus here today. We have a personal relationship with him. We know the Holy Ghost indwells his people. But we see his word spoken right here in the Bible. Alistair Begg uh, puts it this way, and I love how he frames this. Because we have to remember, it's not just the New Testament. It's all of the Bible is about Jesus. And he tells us that in the Old Testament, Jesus is predicted. In the Gospels, Jesus is revealed. In the Acts, Jesus is preached. In the Epistles, Jesus is explained. In Revelation, Jesus is expected. The whole Bible is about Jesus. Go to Acts 2. Look at Peter's sermon that he preaches. Peter is preaching Jesus, an expository, exegetical sermon, meaning he's pulling it from the text. He's not just saying, I want to talk about this and let me Bible search some verses that will promote my cause. He's preaching Jesus from Joel and the Psalms. And if that's not enough for you, you can look at Jesus' own words. Later, go back and read Luke 24. Jesus has been killed on the cross. And he's been laid in a tomb. And his followers are broken and in despair. And you find the story of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And they're just just in grief and mourning. And Jesus has risen and they don't yet know. And it says that Jesus appears to them and they don't really recognize who he is. Jesus doesn't let them see. I'm not real sure how all that went down and what he was doing. You know, it was like COVID and had a mask. I don't know what he did. (laughs) But it says that they didn't recognize who he was. And sometimes, you know how it's that out of place, out of context thing? Jesus to them is dead and in the tomb. And so the last thing they're expecting, though he said, and he later tells them, why are you so surprised? Didn't I tell you this was going to happen? They're not ex- the last person they're expecting to run into on this dirt road is Jesus, the Christ. And Jesus comes up to him, and he, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, and he's like, what's, what's wrong with you guys? And they're like, haven't you heard, man? 
haven't you heard what happened in the city? Haven't you heard what happened to Jesus from Nazareth? A friend of mine likes to say, it's almost like they're like, what have you been doing, man? You've been living under a rock? And he's like, well, yeah, the last three days. <laughs> what have you been doing, man? Where have you, where have you been? And I love it because you get into verse 25. And Jesus looks at him and he says, Oh, fools. And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and then entered into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets and the writings, he expounded in them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What is that? Well, the the Hebrew Bible is divided into three sections. The Old Testament. We have all of those sections in the Old Testament with the Law of Moses or the Torah, the first five books. And then you had the prophets and then you had the writings which started with the Psalms. And so what this is telling us, what Jesus says to them, it says that he starts in the beginning and goes through the entire Old Testament and shows them how all these things were about him. I'm telling you, Alistair Begg is telling you, Peter is showing you, Jesus tells us that the entire Bible is about him. It's all about Jesus. The Old Testament, my friends, is the gospel because it points us to this Jesus. Don't believe the lie, the historic lie, that somehow there's a difference that the God of the Old Testament is this God of judgment And the God of the New Testament through Jesus is just the God of love and grace. Because it's the same God through the entire Bible. There is no difference. The difference is God showing us the consequences of sin in light of that judgment. And points us to the consummation of his ultimate judgment on Jesus Christ on the cross. And the defeating of sin and shows us the way back. The whole Bible, from the garden in Genesis to the new city in Revelation, is all about Jesus and the plan that God has to restore all things. It's all about Jesus. And so for today, we say, who who has all authority? Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. We'll see that later in Matthew 28, when he says, all power, all authority has been given to me. All things were made by him. All things are sustained through him. And today, where do we find Jesus? We find him in his word. We find him in the scripture. And so we have to do as Martin Luther says when we open our Bibles. Martin Luther said, when we come to our Bible, let us come to the Bible as the shepherds went to the manger, expecting to see Jesus. Not just like a gamble where we're like, Lord, maybe you'll say something. No, when you open your Bible to say, Lord, you're going to show me Jesus today. Give me hope because I'm grieving. Give me joy because I'm in despair. Give me clarity because this place is confusing. Show me Jesus because he's here. That's that's, That's huge for us as believers. The word is authority. It's right here. We have it in front of us. We see something powerful in John 1. Where this ultimate authority, this sort of incarnation, right? The God of the universe, this word that created and sustained all things, comes and dwells among people. This incarnation that says he put on flesh and blood. Verse 10 says, he was in the world, the world was made by him, but the world didn't know him. That's got to feel a little... Ray, have you ever come to church one Sunday? I know you're not looking for this, because I know you... But, uh, you know, I have this where I, you know, I show up or maybe I'm a thing and somebody's like, who are you? You know, who are you? You know, I'm, I'm nobody, just, just the pastor here. You know, it's like, you know, we, we're, we're fleshly, we have this. But can you imagine being with God and God, as John tells us in the first few verses, and created all of this and keep it all sustained? And everybody walks by you and doesn't have a clue who you are. Just some, just some a little carpenter dude from Nazareth. And you think, if only they knew. If only they knew. And in 14 it says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's powerful. In his devotional kind of paraphrase of this, Eugene Peterson says it like this. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. He 
moved into the neighborhood. You see, God made a way. God made a way. After the garden, Adam and Eve were put out. He slowly begins to make a way for people to have connection to him. Through the call of Abraham and then through Moses and the people coming out and the establishment of the temple and establishment of the sacrifices, he made a way. But over the course of time, human flesh took control. And we see by the time Jesus arrives on the scene, there's a lot of things that have been added to God's law. Where no longer was this a way for people to connect to him, but it had become a gate that kept people away from him. They were gatekeeping rather than bridging. I talk about this in deaf ministry a lot, especially as a child of deaf adults. You know, there's this meme that goes around, and a lot of people want to ask, you know, a hearing person that's learned some sign language, talk to me about deaf people, but they never want to ask a deaf person. You know, there's this meme where there's a person with like 40 microphones, and it, and it says like, uh, you know, lady who learned ASL in eighth grade, and they're all asking her about deaf people, and there's this deaf person sitting here, and there's no microphone, you know. It's like, who do you want to ask about the experience? And I talk about as a coda. You know, we, we can be a bridge between these two worlds, but it is really easy for bridges to become gates. And what we see here was this, this connection, and it wasn't the completion of what God intended to do, but he had made a way. And even from the beginning, it was for the nations. Go read your Bible. It was that all nations. He didn't tell Abraham he was going to be the father of a whole bunch of people in a nation. He said he would be the father of many nations. The nations were always part of God's plan. That a people, he would have a people from all the nations. And if you say, no, that's just not true, well, then I don't know what you do with Ruth and Rahab and a bunch of other people from the Old Testament who were not in the bloodline, but they were brought in. They were brought into the people of God. But the bridge became a gate. And suddenly the God of the universe comes in, lives among a people. He makes himself accessible and available to the people. In Bible translation or linguistics, we call this a common vernacular. What does that mean? Uh, we would say that how y'all talk. right? That just means how people talk how people communicate. What does it sound like and what are the words that people use in the bodega when they're talking to one another? Common language. You know, we talk about Bible translation, that our goal is to make the Word of God available in that how y'all talk. How do people actually communicate to one another? It's the best way to understand the gospel message. If I sat down in, in, in a coffee shop down the road and, and started talking in Greek, that doesn't help you at all. But if I use words that you're familiar with and introduce the gospel to you in that way, what's well, life-changing? So God does that. He makes himself available in the common vernacular and how all y'all are. He put on flesh and blood and he moved into the neighborhood and he lived among us. He lived among people. The New Testament tells us he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. He gave these things up. And so as Jesus tells us later, so that he could die and then enter into his glory. And so Jesus, through the incarnation, yes, so that we could have justified salvation, but he makes God available and accessible to people. And mirroring this approach, we see Paul living out kind of that incarnational lifestyle in Acts 17 where he's in Athens. Paul does two things. We see him in the synagogues, preaching to the Jews in a very formal way. And then we see him in the Oropagus out here in the marketplace talking to the Athenians. You remember that where he says, look, I see all these idols you've built and to, to this God and to this God and to this God and to this God. And at least you're honest because you got this one in the end that says to the unknown God. Well, I'm here to tell you about him and he trumps all these other things. How would Paul have known about all that? Because he lived among the people. He lived among the people. We're mirroring Christ's ministry. What not just would Jesus do, but what has he done? It would be that we live among a people. You would be hard pressed to write anything that could convince me that the scriptures calls us to be com communal living apart from everybody. Because he tells us that we'll be, sent, we'll be in the world, just not of it. We have to be among the people. Who are your friends? 
How homogenous are your relationships? One of the biggest problems we have with engaging our neighbor in our culture and society today is we no longer engage our neighbor, we engage our demographic. We follow the things that we like to follow, the people that share our ideas, the people that like to listen to the kind of music we like. Outside of this context here, we probably, most people around the country go to a church where everybody looks like them, the music is the kind that they like to listen to, has the same style. The politics are all the same. They pretty much vote in voting blocks. Everything's just homogenous, and they know nothing about what it means to engage another type of person. So we get this conflict. I was in Tennessee about 10, well, COVID's messed me up, 15 years ago, I guess now, uh, meeting with this very large church. And we're talking about deaf ministry. And they're like, yeah, JR, the same thing. I don't, I don't think there are deaf people in our town. And I'm like, yeah, okay, well, well. Sure, let's go lunch. And um, we're driving to lunch. This is a massive church. I think they have maybe five or 6,000 people on a Sunday. And we're two miles from the church, two miles. And we're driving by, and it's, God does this all the time. And I'm like, this is too easy. We passed the state school for the deaf. A couple hundred students live on campus year-round. We don't know who's in our neighborhood because we're not engaging our neighborhood. We're not talking to our neighborhood. We're not talking to our neighbors. We say, well, that's just not quite how the culture works here. And we forget we're called to a kingdom culture. We're called to something higher. We have to mirror this incarnational ministry. And, 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 and Jesus, as he himself became available and accessible to people. And we find him in his word. And so for us, guys, Jesus doesn't have to be a mystery. He's available and accessible to us. The Bible is available and accessible to us. And it's our responsibility to advance that, to continue to make him known. In Matthew 28, it's kind of this big kind of pinnacle moment for the church. Everybody knows, the disciples know that Jesus has risen from the dead. And you get into verse 16, and it says, The eleven disciples went away into Galilee to a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. And some doubted. What does that tell us? We're going to gather. We're going to have people that are gathering with us week after week after week who are committed and devoted here to see Jesus and here to take him to the nations. And we're always going to have a people among us that are going to doubt. That's okay. That's okay. Because we can keep pointing them to Jesus. He tells us some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Not just earthly power. It wasn't a coup, and now he's in charge of Rome. He says, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so what does he do with all this immense power? What is the command that he gives the disciples after he says, look, I'm in charge. No matter where you go, you die, I'm still in charge. Because the power from heaven and earth has been given. He tells them to do this thing. He says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. And then he encourages them, and lo, and listen, I am with you always, even unto the ends of the world. Amen. He's done. With all of this power, he tells us, he says, go. Go to the nations. Go make disciples of the nations. Not stay in one place and make a whole bunch of disciples of one nation. Though God might call some to do that. The command on the church was that we go to make disciples of all the nations. Acts 1.8, this great moment where the Holy Spirit comes in. He says, I will make you my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Follow it. Go back and read Acts. It's this amazing thing. God tells them, Jesus, this is what I will do. You will be my witnesses to all these places. And yet from Acts 1 to Acts 8, they don't go anywhere. It's amazing, though. It's amazing. Peter and the boys, they leave that room and they preach a sermon. And it says thousands come to faith. I think the number there was like 5,000. Can you imagine preaching a sermon and 5,000 people come forward and get saved? You go to a mega church overnight. And how easy it would have been for them to go, well, this is the model, guys. We stay right here. 
This is the model. But suddenly you get into Acts 8 at the end of 7, and there's a great persecution. Saul, Stephen is stoned to death. And what does it say? And it says the disciples were then scattered because of this persecution. Acts 8.1, the 1881 paradox here. And they were scattered to Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. God says, I will fulfill what I'm telling you I'm going to do. And so he scatters them and he says, watch, this will happen. He calls us and commands us to go to the nations. Friends, the nations are right here in our own backyard as well. They're all around us. Do an assessment sometime and see how many languages are spoken in your church. Listen to me. The effectiveness of your church, the success of your church, city life, will not be measured in seating capacity, but will be measured by your sending. Are you preaching the gospel to the nations? Are you taking the gospel into the other boroughs? Are you partnering with kingdom-minded churches to say, what is needed in Queens and what is needed in Long Island? What is needed in Staten Island? What is needed even in New Jersey? What is needed in Ethiopia and Tigray? What is needed in Marrakesh? Salim, my Lyft driver this morning, is from Algeria. I can't get into Algeria very easily. I can get into a lift, no problem. What are we doing to actively take the gospel to the nations? A couple more points and I'll get out of your way. In 1370, uh, there was a pastor who began to really wrestle with some contentious issues in the community in his church. He's preaching in Europe and yet the people don't have a Bible in their language. The, the, the language of the people, there was no Bible. It was still in Latin, and, and nobody spoke Latin. That wasn't what they spoke at the bodega. And he came under conviction, and he tried to discern, where does authority really lie? Is all authority in the institution of the church? Is all of authority in our tradition? Is all authority in just me and the Spirit? Or is all authority in His Word? And he concluded that, well, all authority, authority is held in the Bible. The Bible has authority on all things because Jesus is in the Bible and his words are in the Bible. And he, 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 he was conflicted. And he said, if that's true, shouldn't the people then be able to access this? And so in 1381, John Wycliffe uh, translates the Bible, begins translation from the Latin Vulgate into the English language. There was no Bible in the English language at this time. And on December 31st, uh, 1384, he dies after, uh, after church service. And in 1401, the church passes what they call the Anti-Wycliffe Statute, persecuting his followers. And then in 1408, uh, there was a gathering of the church that basically said, anyone that translates a Bible, if it's not authorized by the church, it's a crime uh, punishable with charges of heresy. And then in 1415, a council met again and named Wycliffe as a heretic. And they burned all the, all the writings that he had. And then in 1428, listen, we're now nearly a half century after the guy's been dead. And they're still, they're still fighting this issue. The Pope confirms the charges of heresy against Wycliffe. And so what do they do? They make a statement. It says they exhumed his body. It means they dug up his body from the grave. And whatever was left of it, they burned to ashes and then dumped the ashes in a river. In 1440, Gutenberg invents his printing press. This will be instrumental. And then in 1520s, there's a pastor. And he starts wrestling with this contemporary issue. And he says, where does authority lie? Is authority in the church and tradition? Or is authority in the Bible? And he concludes that, no, it's, it's in the Bible and he begins to ask the question, well, if this is where we find Jesus and all authority is, why don't my people have access to it? So in 1523, because of these new rules, uh, he, Tyndale goes to seek permission to do a translation. He's not given permission, uh, but as a lot of zealous preachers are, he does one anyway. In 1525, Tyndale completes the first New Testament. In 1526, it's officially banned and any copies that could be found were ordered to be burned. But thanks to Gutenberg, uh, the printing press uh, made that very hard 
for them to gather those copies. In 1529, he was named as a heretic. And in 1535, they finally seized him. And in 1536, he's found guilty for heresy and he's charged to be burned at the stake. Now, Tyndale had a little John the Baptist in him. If you remember the story of John the Baptist, he calls out the sins of the king and ends up getting his head cut off, you know, as you do. And uh, Tyndale had been making some commotions, calling out the sins of the king at the time. But over this one issue, as they have Tyndale tied to the stake to be burned, he cries out with a prayer. And it's simple, and all he says is, Lord, open the eyes of the king. And in rage, they strangle him at the stake. And then when he's dead and leaning off the stake, they burn his body. They're trying to make God's word available to the people around him. The Lord answers his prayer in the 1600s. For the king, decree of the king, orders the translation of the Bible into the English language, which later provides us with the historic text that is the King James Version. When your pastor tells you to turn to a place in Scripture, you think about the sacrifice that so many people went through so that you could do it so easily and without thought. We have so many Bibles available to to us today. How many of you brought a print Bible with you this morning? Ray, uh, King James Version? What uh, is any specific edition? No. Uh, what color is the, 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 bind, the, the cover? Black. Does it have cross-references in the margins or footnotes? Yeah. Is it a red letter? No. Who, who else brought a print Bible? Uh, King James Version? What, uh, what does it look like? What color is it? It's blue. What color is yours? Is that red? Red, gold cross on the front. That one's like a light blue. Uh, anybody use it on their phone? Anybody's have uh, cross references? You know, you, you know how many we can get today? You can get one that's wide margin so you can take notes. You can get study Bibles. Uh, you can get commentated Bibles. Uh, you can get, you know, f- large font. You know, if you can't read very well, you can't see it very well, you can get red letter. You can get with multiple uh, tabs, you know, bookmarks in there. You can get so many types of Bibles available to you. And if you say, well, I just don't really like to read it. I'm more of an auditory person. You can get an audio Bible or you can listen to someone read it to you. And you say, I don't like that guy's voice. You can get a woman's voice. You can get a South African speaking English and have a South African do it. You can get an Irishman to do it. You can get the sweet little old lady from Nigeria reading you an English Bible. And you say, well, I, I, st- I don't know. It's just kind of boring. It's just this one guy reading it. Well, you can get a dramatized audio version where there's music and sound effects and the voices. When Jesus is talking, it's one voice. And when it's just, you know, the writer John, it's another voice. And, and it gets into the, the parables and they're at the manger scene. And then you can hear the, the sheep in the background. You can get any version you want without thinking about it. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of versions of the Bible in the English language. And yet today, for 1,600 languages around the world, when there's a war going on among their people, my wife is Ethiopian, and so my family, I've got people from Tigray and people from the Amhara region, and they are just slaughtering each other right now. Father-in-law's side of the family is calling the mother-in-law's side of the family cockroaches, and there's a genocide against the Tigrayan people. And if you're not from Tigray and you're Ethiopian and you're saying that's not real true, I get it. It's all it's, it's political, right? But they're slaughtering each other. Slaughtering each other. Child soldiers all across Central Africa. Trafficking across Asia. Disease. War. Poverty. And when anyone from those 1,600 language groups is looking for just a little bit of hope, just, just for Something. There's got to be something more than this. Their Bible looks just like this one. And no matter where they turn, they get absolutely nothing. Page after page after page after page 
of nothing because not one verse has been made available to them in their language. They don't know the hope that you and I take so much for granted. I was talking with a deaf lady in Nairobi, Kenya, who comes from a village on the road, the trade route between Kenya and Uganda. And among these people groups out there, there's an old uh, myth. Uh, There's a lot of animistic beliefs out there. And there was one that was believed that if you had HIV AIDS, the way you got rid of that was you had sex with a deaf child because the spirit they were possessed by would take that away from you because their deafness was a possession. It was a result of some evil spirit. And so most of the deaf uh, in this community ended up with HIV AIDS or ended up in prostitution. And, and I remember talking to this lady and she, who is now a believer, but her saying... I grew up thinking my whole purpose in this life was to rid other people of their AIDS and HIV. Though we know that didn't happen. And then these preachers will say, you are beautifully, you're wonderfully made. And I'm thinking, really? Because I don't see that. I'm told I'm demon possessed. I'm forced to do things I would not want to ever do. And it wasn't until she was able to see, even if just a few, the Bible in Kenyan sign language, her language, and she saw when Jesus wept at the death of Lazarus. That the brokenness of the world isn't what God intends, but Jesus is the solution to the brokenness that came upon the world through sin. And that he does have a plan for my life. How do we do that, church? How do we bring this message to the neighborhood? What is good in the neighborhood? Jesus is that good thing for our neighborhood. And it's not just going to be by you leaving a Bible and a dresser at a hotel. <laughs> you are the witnesses of the gospel. Your church Your church is a beacon of hope in this community. And you are called to not only go out into this community, but to be a people that are praying for the nations and are praying not just, Lord, would you send somebody to these people groups, but Lord, who will you send from city life to the nations? Who will you send from our church to the nations? Who will you raise up to continue to help us reach the deaf community in our city? Who will you raise up from our deaf community to go reach other deaf communities around the world with the gospel? Who are you going to raise up from our church? And how much more are you going to use us to go to Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth? Because that's what God intends to do through you. Right now, the Lord has opened the door where we're working in 30 countries among 123 language communities that have a reach of 190 million people. Our goal is to do missions with you, not for you. Fire Bible Translator says, how can we come behind you and help you fulfill your mission of reaching the nations? Whether that's connecting the dots here in the city or whether that's helping you get somebody abroad so that you can reach the nations. We're here to do that with you. This is, this is your charge, church. It's not the job of a parachurch organization. It's the job of the local church to do this. We're just here to help you see that through. And so I'll end with this. If you're here today, I know I've been talking to believers, to people that profess faith in Christ, but if you're here because you doubt, or you're here because you haven't done that, Friend, Jesus has made himself available and accessible to you. There is nothing that you can do to earn access to him other than to come to him. He says, you who are weary and heavy laden, come to me. Some of you are broken and your spirit is crushed and the weight of everything in your life is upon you. And Jesus says, take my burden. I'll take yours. He's already done it, friend. 
He did it on the cross. Doesn't mean we won't have challenge in this life, but he gives us a hope that it doesn't matter what those challenges are. Friend, seek Jesus. He's available in his word, and he's available to be made known to you through the witnesses in this room. All you have to do is come. Those of you that do believe, I want to challenge you to do three things. To pray. Don't have one prayer session and be done. Develop a culture of prayer among your your Sunday school groups, small groups, whatever it is you guys do here as a church community, that you will develop a routine, a practice of we pray for the nations, that God would be made known among them. Second, be praying about who would go out from among you, whether that's to neighboring cities or to the nations, that you would consider giving your life in that way. And then third, that you would become... (laughs) In Acts 4 and a 1 John 3 church, where you are looking at the needs of the brothers and sisters around the world and you're giving from what you have, that you're a generous church. God has called us to be a generous church. I'm not just saying that because we need funding, because we do. But it's not for me, it's not for us, it's because we are trying to get God's word into places that have never heard of him. People that still ask the question, what is a Jesus? They don't know that he's a person. And church, together, we can tell them it's not a what, it's a who. Let us tell you who he is. So, Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your mission. Thank you for your encouragement and the hope that you give us that you will be with us to the ends of the earth. That we don't have to worry and be anxious for anything. Because, Father... You are not only the one that created all things through Jesus, all these things are sustained. And we know you are actively making all things new. And so, Father, give us that hope. Give us that encouragement. Lord, I pray that you bless this church. I pray that your face shine upon it, Lord, that you would go before them and be beside them and behind them, Lord, that you would bless their children's ministry, their children and their children's children, Lord. That when people think of Brooklyn and they think of hope, they say, Jesus is found at City Life. Do this for us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, JR, for that message. And I want to ask you just to be patient for a little bit. I I encouraged JR to to take as much time as he need. He didn't take the liberty with that. I said, our our folks want to hear the word. And we're usually so careful with the time. And uh, we have children's workers that, that are working overtime right now. And, and that's because I encouraged him just to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And what a, great, what a great thing God's done in my heart and I trust in your heart. So would you just be patient for a few minutes? We'll take a little bit more time, but we're very conscious of the time. Um, boy, the word. Uh, the, the, what's the local church? It's the pillar and ground of the truth. And so once a church gives up or um, walks away from the truth of the entire word, then the church is laying down uh, the cause that Christ has given to us. And so may that never happen at City Life Church. May we always preach the whole counsel of the word of God. May we always... Uh, have a heart to say we're going to get the Bible into the hearts, into the hands and the hearts of people around us and people in prisons and people in other parts of the world. I I couldn't help but think as as J.R. uh, was speaking that even right now, uh, a young man from this church um, has been trained and he's in a foreign country. And I can't even give you a lot of the details about it because his safety it's just his safety is in a very dangerous part with his family and children, his wife and his children with one purpose to preach the word of God, to translate the Bible into a language and a, and a people of thousands that have nev- don't have a copy of the word of God. It's what the church is supposed to do. And so um, I can't help but think that in the new year, and, and by the way, one, one year at Christmas, this church gave generously to help get them into language school, thousands of dollars. That's been your heart. That's been our heart. And I want you to think about that as we take a moment 
to just contemplate what God's doing in our heart. Um, boy, I want to be a part of a ministry that's translating the Word of God and getting it and has the heart to say, we, we don't want to just print Bibles and send them. We want to print Bibles and take them. We want to print Bibles and take them and say, God loves you and sharing the gospel. Boy, God's stirring our hearts this morning. I know that. And if you're here, just like JR said, and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, or you're watching online and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, we want to help you with that. You can find our, our email address or give us a call. Or if you're here in this auditorium today, um, boy, God loves you. That's the message. Jesus was sent. It's the message of the Old Testament, the New Testament. And he came to set us free because we are slaves to sin. And he came not with a message of, hey, do good to people. He came with a message that's much more important than that. It's a message of transformation. It's the gospel that says you're enslaved to sin. And it takes humility to admit that. And he says, I came to set you free. And he did that by dying on the cross, by living a perfect life, and coming out of that tomb that JR said he, he lived under the rock for three days. Well, he came out of that tomb. That rock was rolled away, not so that he could get out, but to show the world that he was gone and that he lives today. And that's the message that we want to get around, across the street and across the, the seas and around the globe. And God's called us to do that. Would you, would you stand with me? Um, maybe God's touching your heart. I just think there are times, and, and times in my life, when God was working in my heart, I just separated myself from, the, from my seat and from the audience, and I came to a, old, uh, to a place like this and just knelt, not as a show, but just as a recognition, God, you're working in my heart, and I, I don't want you to stop working in my heart, and I want to acknowledge that, and I want to listen to you, and I want you to continue doing that, and I'm going to invite you to do that. As, as Robert leads us in this song, how, how's God working in your heart? And would you just, uh, you, sure, you can sit right there or stand there and pray, but maybe you, this is the time when you come down and just kneel down here, maybe a husband and wife. God, what should we do? What more can we do? How are you leading us to take the gospel? What's our part? Maybe it's a single adult, um, but, but maybe just kneel here at this altar and fill this altar and say, God, I hear you, you're speaking. It, you, the message was through JR, but he's not compelling us to do something. He gave us a wonderful message, but it's God working in our hearts that is what we want to respond to.